my pleasure to announce the first speaker, John Hopcroft from Cornell University. John is well known in the computer science community and I think beyond for his work on algorithms and data structures uh, on which he published uh, a book which has become a classic over many, many years together with Jeff Allman and Alfred Aho. He was awarded the Turing Award in 1986 together with Bob Targen, who is also here, uh, for fundamental achievements in the design and analysis of algorithms and data structures. And recently, he has become uh, a consultant to the Chinese Prime Minister on the subject of reforming the uh, Chinese educational system in universities. Um, and he's also a member of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, which is something very rare for foreigners. Um, John will talk about uh, a deep learning and AI, a very hot subject these days. And John, the floor is yours. Yeah. No, it's, it's a pleasure for me to be here uh, today and to give this talk. Uh, one thing I will mention, though, is I'm not going to talk to the laureates who are up front. I'm, I'm going to talk to the young researchers here. And I'm going to give first uh, a brief introduction to machine learning, out of, in case you know nothing about machine learning. And, and then I will talk a little bit about some of the research issues uh, in the area. But first, uh, let, let me tell you that I think we're undergoing an information revolution, and the impact on society will be as great as the impact of the agricultural revolution or the industrial revolution. And one of the main drivers of that is, is learning theory. So to start off, the basis of learning theory is a threshold logic unit. Uh, this device has a number of inputs, and a weight on each input, and it calculates a weighted sum of the inputs. And if the sum is less than the threshold, it outputs a zero. If it's greater than the threshold, it outputs a one. And I'll give you a, a, a simple algorithm for training this unit. What you do is you set the weight vector equal to one of the patterns. And then you repeatedly cycle through the patterns. And if a pattern is misclassified, you either add it or subtract it from the weight vector. If you want an output 1, you add it to the weight vector. If you want an output 0, uh, you subtract it from the weight vector. And this algorithm will quickly converge to a solution if the data is linearly separable. And the reason I put the algorithm up is there's one thing I want you to remember about this. And that is that the weight vector will be a linear combination of the patterns. So if the data is linearly separable, the algorithm will converge and find a hyperplane which separates it. But what if the data is not linearly separable? Then what you might want to do is map the data to a higher dimensional space. And just as an example, in this set of data, I might add a third coordinate and move the data out from the plane by a distance equal to the square of the distance from the origin. And that will pull the zeros out more than the x's, and you can find a hyperplane that will separate the zeros and x's. Uh, this mapping to this higher dimensional space might be to an infinite dimensional space. And you want to run the algorithm that I showed you in this higher dimensional space. But what is interesting, you do not need to know the function f. You don't have to calculate uh, the mapping of the images to run that algorithm. All you need to know is the product of images. So to see that, AI is one of the images, and F of AI is the mapping to the higher dimensional space. W, the weight vector, remember, is going to be a linear sum of the images in the higher dimensional space. If I want to test another image, A sub J, I'm going to multiply the weight vector times f of aj, and you'll notice that I only need products of the mappings of images, not the images themselves. So 
And if I have to, if I'm going to add an image to the weight vector, I don't have to know the image because all I'm going to do is increase or decrease the coefficient of that image. And this allows me to run that algorithm without knowing the function f. All I need to know is products. And this brings in the notion of a kernel. So a kernel you can think of either as a function or as a matrix uh, where it gives you the value of products. The ijth entry in the matrix will be the product of the ith image times the jth image. And an example of a kernel is the Gaussian kernel. And you notice that the function f doesn't appear in it. Uh, if I want to know what the product of f, I, f of a i times f of a j, I simply subtract a i from a j, square it, multiply it by a constant, and raise e to that power. Now, you might ask the question, uh, can I select any kernel I want? Well, not quite. You better select a kernel for which there exists a function giving rise to that kernel. And it turns out there is a simple test as to whether or not there exists a function. Uh, if the matrix is uh, positive semi-definite, uh, then there will exist a function, and you don't need to know that function. So uh, this is the notion of what's called a, a support vector machine. And up until 2012, if you bought a product which had a machine learning algorithm in it, it used the support vector machine technology that we just talked about. Uh, and there exist many kernels other than the, the Gaussian uh, kernel. But it turns out uh, something uh, changed in 2012, and that was the advance of deep learning. And I'll say a few words about that. It came about due to an ImageNet competition. Uh, there is a collection of 1.2 million images, and they come from 1,000 categories, and each image is labeled by the category it belongs to. And one of the things that's very important about uh, uh, the world today is the amount of data that we have. This is one of the drivers of the information revolution. So this Im ImageNet competition, the way it worked, you would, if you wanted to enter the competition, you were given 50,000 images along with their labels. And up until 2012, uh, the winner of the competition had an error rate of about 25%. And it turned out that the improvement were only a fraction, they were about at one-tenth of a percent. And until 2012, when a particular network called AlexNet came along, and the error rate dropped to 15%. And it turns out that this was such a major improvement uh, that people took the technology and applied it in many applications, in uh, economics and biology and manufacturing, and it seemed to work wherever they applied it, although people don't know why it works, and that's a fundamental research problem today. But then, quickly, people extended it. AlexNet, I, I will show you what it is in a minute, but it was about uh, five, eight, eight levels deep. Uh, people have now extended the depth up to a thousand levels, and they've reduced the error rate to under 4%. And the best that humans can do, who have been trained, is about 5%. So computers can now classify images better than, than humans. So uh, AlexNet uh, used something which had some levels which were called convolution levels. And in a convolution level, you had a little three by three window, which you slid, slid across the screen, uh, one, row at a, one column at a time, and then you drop down one row at a time. 
and, and you made another image, essentially the same size, uh, by having a threshold logic unit getting nine inputs from, from that window. And what that window supposedly did was found features. So if there was a corner, it might detect it, or it might detect an edge, or something of that type. And what you would like to do is detect many different images. So you'll, you'll notice uh, that up, up here, uh, these gates build another image of this size with one feature. But you have many of these images, and in fact about 62 different features. So you can see the size that this network is going to get to be. Uh, <clears throat> and what you have then to reduce the size of the network is you have another level which is called uh, pooling. And here there's a two by two window, and that two by win two window is slid over two cells at a time. And what you do is you simply take the maximum value. Now, you might say you're losing a little bit about position. But it turns out position is not that important. If you're trying to recognize a human face, you don't need to know the exact distance between two eyes or how much the eyes are above the nose or the nose above the mouth. All you need to know is roughly the relationship. So the pooling doesn't, does, doesn't hurt you. So AlexNet had actually five levels of convolution and then three fully connected levels and then something called softmax. And the way this worked is you put an image in and then you adjusted these weights to get the correct classification. And a network has millions of weights. So you can understand that you're taking the derivative, uh, a million derivatives, to do gradient descent. Now, what another researcher did is he changed this slightly. Instead of classifying images, uh, he built a network to recreate the image. And at first you might ask, how can you do that if you have fewer gates in between than the number of cells in the image? But realize, uh, let, let's say there were 100 gates, 100 input gates, There's, and the value, of, let's say, was either a zero or one input, there would be two to the 100 possible inputs. But you have only a few hundred thousand images, so there's enough storage inside to have a unique uh, code for every image. So you can train the network to reproduce the image. But what, the reason I put this up is it turns out that he started to look at what these gates learned. And he discovered that there was one gate that only had a positive output if the image was that of a cat. And he never said which images have cats in and which don't. And this told us that we could do unsupervised learning. And the reason unsupervised learning is important, uh, if this is going to be the technology that drives your car, as you're driving around Heidelberg, you would like your car to be learning. Uh, it, it can't be trained for every possible situation that it's going to encounter, but you train it so it'll do a, a good job, and then it will become better and better as, as, as it drives. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about something I'm going to call activation space. And <clears throat> what I can do is create a vector uh, where each coordinate of the vector is going to correspond to the output of a gate. And I will create a vector for each image. And for an image, that activation vector is going to represent it. Now, it turns out I'm going to use two types of activation vectors. Uh, this will be an image activation vector. But what I really have is I have a matrix where the rows of the matrix correspond to gates and the columns to images. And you can have an activation vector, which is a column, which is the one I described, and I'll call it an image activation vector, or a row. 
and a row corresponds to a single neuron, and you'd be interested in that if you want to know what that neuron learned. So if I have an image and I want to find the corresponding activation vector, I simply feed the image into my network and I have the activation vector. But what's interesting is if you give me an activation vector, what image produced it? And one way, there's many ways to solve this problem. I'm just going to give you a simple one. Pick a random image, see what activation vector it has, and then do gradient descent on the pixels of the random image to cause the activation vector to move to the activation vector that you want to recreate. And if you do that, uh, you will have the image that produced the activation vector. And I'm going to now show you some experiments that, that people do. <clears throat> what I can do is I can take the activation vector at the beginning of the network and call that the content of the image. And I can take the activation vector at the far end, or actually several of them, and take the product with itself and call that the style. And then I can take an image, say, of our, one of our former presidents, and I can ask, what would he look like if he was 20 years older? So what I do is I take the, his content, but then I take 200 images of older people and I, for the style, I use the average of the style of this 200 older people and I create uh, an image of Bush if he was 20 years older. Uh, it turns out each year uh, I bring 30 students from China over to Cornell University who have just completed their uh, junior year. And these students had not heard of learning theory when they came. And one of them, and each of them has to do a brief a research project. So one of them took a picture of Cornell and said, what would Cornell look like if it was in Asia? So it took a piece of Asian artwork, and that's what Cornell presumably might look like if it was in Asia. So, I'm going to show you some other experiments that, that we did. Uh, here, the top row, in the middle of the top row, is another picture of Cornell. And on either side are some pictures that we want to use for style. And what we did is we recreated the picture of Cornell in these various styles. And the bottom two rows, in one case, we used a network which had been trained. But in the middle, case, uh, we used uh, just random weights. We did no training. And you'll notice that with random weights, we actually, I think, did better than with a trained network. And this raises the interesting research question, which things are we doing require training, which takes maybe a month, or we could use random weights? And the reason that's important is if we could test the ability of networks, how good they are by using random weights, we could test thousands of structures in an hour rather than one structure in a, in a month. And it turns out quite a few things can be done with random weights. I, th I thought I would now talk about some research questions. Uh, one of them is, what do individual gates learn? And there's just a number of questions. Uh, and one of these students from China who came over took a very simple network. He took just 10 by 10 images, uh, which were black and white. And the images were letters, which could be made up with rectangles. And he asked this question, uh, how does what a gate learns evolves over time? And he looked at the gates as a function of training time. And he noticed that three gates started to learn the size of the letter, how many cells were black and how many were white. But after a little while, two of the cells decided it didn't make sense to have three cells learn the same thing. And they switched to something else. 
I think this was a fundamental observation and it raises the question, why did they change and how did they decide what they should, should learn? Um, another thing I'll just point out that if you're trained the network to look at photographs, let's say outdoor photographs, and then you want it to train it again for indoor photographs, which are fundamentally different. It turns out you don't have to retrain the first level because what the first level actually learns is features of photographs independent of what the photographs are of. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of interesting research questions uh, and they're relatively simple ones. I'm going to talk a little bit about the training. Uh, it turns out that there are many local minima. Some are better than others and we'll explore that. And training takes a long time. Can, can we speed it up? So let me first talk about local minima. What I have plotted here is the error function on the training data. And you'll notice that there are two local minima. One is very broad and one is very sharp. And if I have a choice, which one should I take? And uh, what I want, what I haven't told you about is generalization, which is one of the most important things in learning theory. Why do you believe that if you train a network on some training data, that it's going to work well on real data. And it turns out the theory of that is quite well known and uh, you can uh, look that up. But I'm going to suggest that you take the broad minima. And the reason for that is if our training data is a good statistical sample of the full data, then if I plot the error function for the full data, it should be very close to this. And the dotted line would be an example. And you notice that if that curve just shifts a little or gets modified a little, this broad minimum, the error function, the error is not going to change much. But for the sharp minimum, it's going to change a lot. And so there are questions like, which minima should we take? Important uh, questions. <clears throat> uh, but something else, when you're doing gradient descent, uh, the error function, remember if you have 50,000 images, the error function has a term, 50,000 terms in it, and you have a million weights. So you're going to take a million derivatives of 50,000 terms, and that's, that's what gradient descent would do. But researchers have said, how about stochastic gradient descent? let's change the error function and randomly select one term, do one iteration on minimizing that, then randomly select another, and this could speed up the process by a factor of 50,000. Uh, that would change, what, months to minutes, something like that. Uh, and it didn't surpri doesn't surprise me that it speeds things up, but it also finds a better local minimum. And why? And here's possibly the answer. Suppose I'm doing gradient descent, uh, and I start over here, and I'm doing full gradient descent, I will come down and I will find this local minima, whereas this one is much better. But notice that if I pick a random image, uh, it's likely to shift me over into this region. I'll pick another random image, and most of the times it'll shift me towards the center. Uh, sometimes it'll shift me the other way, but the vast majority it'll go towards the center. Whoops. So what will happen um, is I will move in here. And when I start to oscillate, then what I'll do is I'll increase the number of images to maybe 50. I'll randomly select 50. And that might reduce the variance. And then finally, when I get down in here, I'll do full gradient descent and get to a much better local minimum. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about things you can learn. Uh, suppose you have two tasks and you learn them separately. And you ask the question, what's common to these two tasks? 
You could modify this network like this and train a network for both tasks. And what is likely to happen is these gates will learn what is common. And I'm just going to go through a number of examples like this quickly to show you things that you can explore. Um, I mean, one of the things we know is that if you learn two languages when you're five years old, there's one place in the brain that will process both languages. Uh, if you learn two lang one when you're five and the other language when you're 20, it's two different places in the brain and you're actually translating back and forth. And so this gives you a way to study that. <clears throat> Another um, thing is at one time people were trying to do image generation. They wanted a computer program, they could type in the word cat and the computer would generate an image of a cat. And at first you might ask, why do that? Why not just go on the network and find a cat? Well, if you want a composite image, if you want an image of a cat sitting on the beach watching the sunset, you might not be able to find that image on the network and you'd like to generate it. And initially, people weren't able to do, solve this problem at first until something called an adversarial network came along. And what they did is they had two networks. One was their image generator and the other was a network that they trained to distinguish between a real image and a synthetic image. And so they trained their image generator until it could fool the synthetic uh, image uh, discriminator. Then they trained the discriminator to do a better job and then they went back to the image generator and by working back and forth, they got reasonable images. But the reason I mention this is this is a very important concept and is used in hundreds of applications. And one of them is language translation. Uh, the way people used to do language translation is they would find pairs of text in the two languages and use that to train uh, to learn how to translate. But what if you have a language, two languages where you don't have any common text? What you could do is the following. Uh, you could uh, train a discriminator to determine if a sentence is a real sentence or whether it's a synthetically generated one. And what they did is they first uh, created, they took a, a sentence, say in English, and just produced a sequence of German words. Then they fed it into the discriminator and tried to uh, readjust things so it would be a sentence. And then they took the, the German sentence and translated it back into English words and then used this, the discriminator to make that a sentence. And then finally they trained the whole thing to make sure the sentence you got back was the, the sentence you put in. And then uh, the, the German sentence in the middle there uh, would be a good translation of the English sentence. And this is just to show you how this at, uh, 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 technology can be used in, in many problems. And I want to just quickly talk about now some simple things. Uh, when we train a network, uh, for a given category, we train it with a thousand images. Uh, but when I, my daughter uh, was maybe three years old or so, I used to sit on the couch with her with a book called The Best Word Book Ever. And it has many images and initially I would go through and point at house and say house and then dog and so forth. A little later I'd go through and point at the images and she would tell me what they were. But there's just one image of a fire engine. And one day we went out for a walk and there was a fire engine parked on the street. Doesn't look like the image very, that much at all, but she pointed to it and she said, dad, fire engine. She learned by one image. And the question is, is there some way, it's possible in the first three years of her life, she learned how to uh, learn images. And then she learned how to just learn from a single image. 
And that's something we have to figure out how to train these networks on, on a single image. Uh, something you've probably heard about is fooling. Uh, and this is an image of a cat. And what I did is I went in and I changed a few pixels and got another image. You probably can't see the difference of those two images. And you would say cat, right? But when we fed it into the deep network, <laughs> that's an automobile there. <laughs> uh, now, this, this might make you a little bit nervous because this is the technology which is going to drive you around Heidelberg in a few years. <laughs> and uh, if it sees a stop sign, it don't, and someone put a little piece of tape on it, uh, you don't want it to say green light. Uh, and it turns out that a minor change can change any image from the proper classification to an arbitrary classification. And you might wonder, you know, why, how can that possibly be? Uh, and you might think, how, how can you have carve up space into 10 categories so that any point in one category is arbitrarily close to a point in any other category. Now you might say, mathematicians will say well, that's trivial, let's talk about two categories. One of them the real numbers, uh, the rational numbers, the other the irrational. Every rational is arbitrarily close to an irrational and vice versa. Uh, but I won't allow that because the category, what your, the function or whatever, has got to be polynomial. Uh, and how, how can you do this? Um, so, so that's an interesting uh, research problem. I should repeat, we don't know why this deep learning works. Uh, we know it works, and we have to develop the theory uh, as to why. Every time I give this talk, uh, I'm asked, is artificial intelligence real? Uh, and the answer, uh, answer, in my view, is no. Uh, it turns out that deep learning is simply classifying objects uh, by doing pattern recognition in high dimensional space. Uh, the networks do not learn the, the purpose of an object or something like that, and I'll, I'll come back to that in just a minute. Uh, if you trained a deep network, to classify railroad cars as box cars, flat cars, tank cars, engine, caboose, passenger car, and you showed it this image, it might very well say that's either a box car or a flat car with something sitting on it. But if you look at it carefully, you'll notice that there are motors on the wheels, and you'll say it's an engine, even though there's no cab for someone to sit in. Uh, it turns out in switchyards, they use these engines now, they're remote controlled, there's nobody in them, uh, to arrange the cars uh, for a train. So I'll just repeat, uh, deep learning is pattern recognition in high dimensional space, and it deals with the shape of the image, and it does not abstract the function or another property of, of the image. So uh, when we talk about AI, a lot of things that we think about uh, as artificial intelligence are really just come about because of the computing power. Uh, for example, if uh, learning to play chess, when I was a child, I thought to play chess required intellectual ability. Uh, but the, the way computer programs play chess, uh, they have a game tree. Uh, the root of the tree is the initial position of the board, and for every possible move, there's a node underneath showing what the board would be. And when you play chess, you probably go down three or four levels. You don't search the whole breadth of the tree, just uh, that wouldn't be possible. But the computer has is faster than you are, and so it can go a few more levels, and therefore it can probably beat you, okay? So it turns out um, where uh, I used to think, uh, I used to have a, a good definition of intelligence. 
uh, I thought intelligence was the ability to solve problems. And now uh, I realize that's not a good definition. Uh, it depends on how you solve those problems. So if you're interested more in philosophy, it would be good to come up with a definition of what, what is intelligence. Uh, because I, I can no longer uh, answer questions about when are we going to have real intelligence because I no longer really know what it is. But I, I would like to just close by mentioning something that happened to me uh, when I gave a, a talk on AI on deep learning, uh, I was out, out actually in, in California and, and I was uh, lecturing at a company called Applied Materials. And uh, I had talked about deep learning and afterwards somebody asked me uh, a, a question and they said, is there any relationship uh, between uh, deep learning and how the brain learns? And that gave me an opportunity to just mention uh, something else, which is very related if you're interested in, in the notion of learning theory. Um, I have talked to many people who talked about early childhood education. And I asked each of them, or, or they told me, uh, the earlier you do something, the bigger the payoff. And I asked them, well, how early? And their answer was, the first two years of a child's life. And, and that surprised me. And so I said, uh, where, where is the research uh, that supports this? Now, the people I was talking to were in child learning. They weren't researchers. And they said, well, we don't know, but surely there must be research that supports it. So, so I went and I tracked down. And it turns out, in the last 25 years, there has been significant research in the area of how the brain develops. And there's also been research in uh, the value of early childhood education. And, and it is apparently true that investing in the first two years is where you'll get the biggest return. Because when a child is born, the neurons are present in the brain, but the wiring is very fluid. And in the first two years is when the child learns how to learn. And if that's done well, then the child will do very well in the rest of their life. Uh, and it turns out the claim of these researchers is that if you provided high quality free childcare for the first few years, you'd get your money back 25 years later on, uh, uh, to pay for it. And what was interesting is after the talk, someone came up to me and they said, our company has, um, uh, we have a nonprofit where we fund things. And one of the things we fund uh, is remedial childcare for every high school student who needs it in Mountain View, California. But it's very expensive. And what they said to me is, would it make sense for us to take some of our resources and fund early childhood? And what that would do is reduce the cost 25 years later. I, I just thought I would mention that because when you do research, uh, it's also important to get it out to the general population uh, because if they know, it can have an impact on changing society. And with that, I think I'm within the five minutes that I can take uh, at least. And I'd like the questions to come from the young researchers, uh, not, not just our, our laureates. Okay, there's the first question back there. Just wait for the microphone, please. All right, so fascinating worldwide tour. Given your work on automata, um, automata theory, you, all the examples you showed in, in, in the machine learning part were about vision, but I was wondering in, in other domains, being able to then map what you've learned back to automata theory could be really powerful. I, I wonder, I'm wondering if you thought about that. Um, I've, I've thought a little bit about that. Uh, I, I should tell you a little bit about my background. Uh, I actually graduated before computer science existed. Uh, my, my degree was in electrical engineering. And I was hired at Princeton in an electrical engineering department. But what was fortunate for me 
is the chair of the department understood that the future was going to have computer science. And so he said, please develop a computer science course for us. And what was interesting, since there were no courses and no books, I had to ask, well, what does one teach in a course in computer science? And he gave me a few research papers on automata theory and said, if you cover these, uh, it'll be a good course. Uh, the reason I mention it, there's, there is a lesson here for our, our young researchers. Uh, the fact that I, this, this course made me one of the world's first computer scientists. And so 15 years later, when our government was looking for a senior computer scientist, even though I was only in my 40s, I was on the short list. And the first President Bush uh, asked me if I would be on the National Science Board, which funds science uh, uh, research in the US. And imagine if I had been in high energy particle physics. I would still be waiting today for the senior faculty ahead of me to retire. <laughs> but because there were no senior people ahead of me, I had fantastic opportunities that you normally wouldn't have. Now, when I tell this, uh, this story to students that I teach, they say, well, you were just lucky because you were at the right time. But let me tell you that you're also at the right time because there's a fundamental revolution going on uh, in computer science and in the world. During my career, uh, we were uh, teaching and develop, doing research on making computers useful. So we were interested in algorithms, compilers, databases, and so forth. But computers today are useful. And now we're switching to what are they being used for. And uh, so I think one of the things is you're likely to interact with people in other domains. Uh, the size of problems is going to be much bigger. And, and there's really a chance for you to position yourself, those of you that are computer scientists, in, in a fundamentally new area. But also those of you in mathematics, all of a sudden mathematics, a certain part of mathematics has become very important. Uh, we sort of refer to it as applied mathematics because now all of these applications that we can do that we couldn't do before because we didn't have the computing power uh, are developing new types of mathematics to solve them. But I, I worry about that automata theory course because when I teach in China, they asked me if I would teach that course and we're phasing it out of US universities. And I was a little nervous about creating it in China, but I decided may, maybe it made sense because it, that expertise hadn't been developed in China yet. Uh, in the US, if you want a compiler written, there's thousands of people who can do it for you. Uh, it's not clear in China that they have that kind of expertise. Time for one more question and a short answer. So. <laughs> Over there, please. Just get. Hi, thank you so much for your time. It was amazing listening to you. Uh, I have a question regarding interpretability of deep learning models. Uh, what are your thoughts on how do we build actionable insight from the deep learning models, which itself theoretically is little understood right now, and in special, specifically for its application in medical domain and uh, domains like genomics and stuff. I, I, I missed part of it. Is it how, how do we train this in like medical domains and how do we uh, what, what are your thoughts oh. on interpretability? Oh, uh, we we actually so if, if the question is how do we figure out what it's doing? Uh, I don't think we know how to do that yet. Uh, and th this is an important uh, research area uh, because if computers if say deep learning is start going to start making decisions, people are going to want to know how, what, what decision is it making and is it biased? Uh, because biases can creep in, in in your training data and other, other ways. And so it's fundamental to figure out how they're doing it uh, and so forth. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Don.